Okay guys, I realized in class this week, we really didn't work through any of the on your own problems. So I wanted to make sure to include those in this video. <clears throat> so we talked about the law of mass conservation, which is basically that matter cannot be created or destroyed. It can only change forms. And that was also one of the purposes of the experiment that we did. So on your own problem 2.1 says a compound is decomposed into its constituent elements of carbon, nitrogen, and hydrogen. So uh, the way I would do this, let's say a compound. Okay, and it's decomposed into nitrogen, hydrogen, and carbon. Whoops, I put them in the wrong order, but if the if in the decomposition 12.0 grams of carbon 14.0 grams of nitrogen and 3.0 grams of hydrogen were formed what was the mass of the compound before it was decomposed okay so we have compound i'm sorry i'm trying to video this and write this at the same time i don't really feel like i'm succeeding okay so let's do 12.0 grams carbon plus 14.0 grams nitrogen plus 3.0 grams of hydrogen. Okay, so basically all you do because of the law of mass conservation is you add these three numbers together. So 12.0 plus 14.0 is 26.0 plus 3.0 is 29. Grams of compound. Okay, so hopefully everyone sees that's easy. It's going to have three significant figures because every number has three significant figures. Um, yeah, okay, let's move on. Okay, guys, so now I want to go through on your own problems 2.2, 2.3, 2.4 very quickly. I am so sorry if you hear background noise, my kids. Um, okay. So if you remember, when you're looking at your periodic table, you have a jagged line right here, do, 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 separated by this kind of green and red, and that separates your metals and your non-metals. So to the right of the zigzag jagged line are your non-metals, and to the left are your metals. Now, of course, your exception is hydrogen, way over here, and you see that it's grouped as a red. Okay, so that's your exception. I went ahead for ease of showing you guys circled the elements that are in these questions so that it'll be easy to find, easy to reference. Okay, so what, which of the following elements are metals? So then they list sulfur, calcium, astatine, thallium, hassium, xenon, and hydrogen. Okay, so which are metals? We've got sulfur right here. Is sulfur a metal? No, because it's to the right of the jagged line, it's a non-metal, so it's not that one. Then we have calcium. Calcium's way over here. Is calcium a metal? Yes, calcium's a metal. Then we have astatine, um, which is, why am I having trouble finding this? I even circled them ahead of time. AT, okay, here we go. It's right here. Is it a metal? Nope, it's a non-metal. Okay, then we have thallium right here. Is it a metal? Yep, it's a metal. Xenon. Xenon is right over here. Is it a metal? Nope. It's a non-metal. And hydrogen. Is it a metal? No. Even though it's listed to the left, it's the exception. Okay, so which elements are the metals? You have calcium, thallium, and hassium. Those are the metals for question 2.2. Okay, moving on. Question 2.3. If you want to make a wire for an electrical system and you have only the following elements to work with, which should you choose? And then they give you silver, which is AG, uh, phosphorus, P, or bromine, BR. Okay, so the first thing that you should recognize is if you're wanting to set up an electrical system, then you're going to need an element that conducts electricity. Okay, and you know that metals conduct electricity. So you are looking for a metal. 
So bromine's here, it's a non-metal. Phosphorus is here, it's a non-metal. And silver is here, it's a metal. So the only possible answer for this system is going to be silver. You've gotta have a metal to conduct your electricity. All right, and 2.4. Which of the following would you expect to be brittle? Cobalt, uh, cesium, and carbon. Okay, so you guys have to remember your properties of metals and non-metals. You should remember that brittle, being brittle, is a property of a non-metal. So that is what we're looking for. So cobalt, is it going to be brittle? No, it's a metal. Um, cesium. Is it going to be brittle? No, it's a metal as well. Carbon, is it going to be brittle? Yes, it's a non-metal, okay? So hopefully you guys um, understand what I'm doing. Basically, you're gonna need to be familiar with your elements, remember they told you that, and you're definitely gonna wanna be familiar with all the properties of metals and non-metals. Remember, your non-metals are brittle, they lack luster, they do not conduct electricity. Your metals, they can be easily shaped or bent. They do have luster and they definitely conduct electricity, okay? Um, you also have your metalloids, remember, that have properties of both. An example of that is silicon. Uh, it has some properties for each of them, but all right. Hopefully that's helpful for when you were working through those problems. All righty. So next we're moving on to the law of definite proportions. And this law states that the proportion of elements, ooh, sorry about that, you guys have my fan on. <laughs> the proportion of elements in any compound is always the same. And one of the best ways to think about this formula is thinking about recipes. So if your grandma has a secret recipe for making chocolate chip cookies, think about it that way. There's proportion of eggs to flour to sugar to vanilla, and it's always the same proportion. If you make one batch of cookies, you use this much amount of sugar. If you're going to make two batches of cookies, you would multiply everything by a factor of two. That's a similar concept. That's how, that's how you should be thinking about the law of definite proportions. So one example, one, one thing that they talk about in your book is they talk about the formula for making water. And they tell you, um, so for water, oh my goodness, I need to turn my fan off. So they tell you, you know from water, um, everybody knows, well, most people probably know that water is H2O. So you need both hydrogen and you need oxygen. Well, the formula, for making water is for every one gram of hydrogen, you need eight grams of oxygen. So if I said I have 80 grams of oxygen, how much hydrogen would I need? It would be 10 grams of hydrogen because you multiply the eight by 10 and you would do the same thing. I'm hoping this makes sense to you guys. We're gonna go and work through an example. So if you have your book, Let's look at figure 2.3, okay? So we're gonna work through that a little bit together just to make sure that you understand it. It says, a chemist decides that she wants to make table salt. Okay, so table salt is sodium chloride. All right, she wants to make table salt. She's already determined that it's made of sodium and chlorine. What she doesn't know is the proportion of each element that she needs to use in order to make it, okay? So they tell you that she uses ten grams of sodium plus ten grams actually it's ten point zero grams of chlorine, and she gets. 16, oh, I'm so sorry, guys, 0.5 grams of table salt, but she also has 3.5 grams of leftover sodium. All right, so what do you know about looking at this? 
what you know is that all of the chlor all of the chlorine was used up because there's no extra. However, there is extra sodium. So we started with more sodium than we actually needed. So what you can do is figure out the formula or the recipe for making table salt. Because you know that we started with 10.0 grams of sodium. You know that there was 3.5 grams of sodium left over. So how much sodium was actually used in the equation? 6.5 grams of sodium. Okay, great. Another thing I want you to notice is the law of mass conservation. You can see it really quick. Um, there's a total of 20.0 grams. And here, when you count everything, even the leftover, there's a 20.0 grams, okay? So now let's look and check our formula and see if it works with nothing left over. So if I take 6.5 grams of sodium plus 10.0 grams of chlorine, and guess what? I get 16.5 grams of salt, nothing is left over, my mass conservation, everything adds. So this is my formula for making, to for making table salt. I hope this is making sense. And this is the concept of the law of definite proportions. Okay, so I wanna work through another example with you guys. Kinda of have papers flying everywhere, so. All right, so let's say a chemist is trying to, well, okay, come up with a formula. So they use 100.0 grams of calcium and they add 100.0 grams of chlorine and they find that they get 156 0.5 grams of calcium chloride plus some amount of calcium left over. Okay? Can you figure out the recipe for this? And the answer is yes. Okay? So you know from the law of mass conservation that you started with 200 grams, right? So you know but this needs to be 200 grams. So we can figure out how much calcium was left over. Excuse me, guys. <clears throat> so we just simply take 200.0 grams minus 156.5 grams, and you get 43.5 grams of calcium was left over, okay? So now that I know how much calcium was left over, I can figure out how much calcium was used, right? Because I know how much I started with and I know how much is left over. So I take what I started with, 100.0 grams of calcium, how much is left over, 43.5 grams of calcium, and I get 56.5 grams of calcium. So what's the formula or the recipe for this problem? It would be 56.5 grams calcium plus 100.0 grams chloride equals 156.5 grams calcium chloride and nothing else is extra. I'm hoping that everybody sees that um, I'm really hoping. Okay, so now let's take this step, this problem a step further and make it a bit harder. Let's say after you find the formula that they're asking, all right, well, <laughs> how much calcium and how much chloride would you need to have a 
that much calcium chloride, okay? So the first thing we're gonna do, because we have our formula, but it's in grams, and they're giving us kilograms right here. So as I'm gonna convert that to grams. So you can write it out. I'm just gonna do it in my head. You're welcome to write it out, but for time's sake, it's gonna be 10 to the third grams calcium chloride. Okay, so basically I have my formula and I know what I'm looking for. So now I need to find out what proportion, what factor I need to multiply everything by. I'm really hoping I explain this well. It's, it's a lot of math, so I'm not sure where everyone is in their math, but hopefully this makes sense. If it doesn't, please let me know. I'll try and get together with you um, to help it make sense to you. But basically, I'm going to divide this number, the number I want, with this number to find out what do I have to multiply this number by to get this number, okay? So you can think of it, um, you can think of it this way. So 156.5 grams calcium chloride. And I have to multiply it by some number, X, uh, let's do X, okay? And that's gonna equal 1.500 times 10 to the third grams calcium chloride. So basically to solve for X, you divide by 156.5 grams calcium chloride. So you're going to get X here. You divide by 156.5 grams calcium chloride. Okay. And your units are actually all going to cancel out and everything. And you're going to get So that's going to be your factor, okay? That's what you're multiplying everything by. All right. So if I multiply everything by this number in my formula, remember this is my formula, I will get the answer to their question. So 56.5 grams calcium times 9.5. Five nine seven, and that is going to give me 542 grams of calcium. If I do the same thing, 100.0 grams of chloride multiplied by 9.597 should give me, hopefully I did my math, 959.7 grams of chloride. And of course, when we already did this essentially, but 156.5 grams calcium chloride times 9.5. We did this when we divided it out and it should give us our answer times 10 to the third. Okay, so I'm hoping this makes sense. It's a lot of math, but this is the concept of the law of definite proportions. And then of course you can see the concept of the law of mass conservation coming into play. All right, so the last one I wanna work through is the on your own. I think it is, I need to turn my page in my book. 2.5. So that was a little bit more complicated than what I just did, but I wanted you guys to see it. All right, so on your own, 2.5. All right, when 24 grams of the element carbon react with 8.08 .08 grams of the element hydrogen, 24.0 grams carbon plus 8.08 .08 grams hydrogen, natural gas, Stuff that is burned in a gas stove or gas furnace is produced. Okay, so it produces natural gas. Um, how much carbon and hydrogen would you need to make 128.4? So 128.4 grams of natural gas. 
Oh, and I forgot a step because they tell you when I react, 24. Okay, so I can figure out how much natural gas is produced by the law of mass conservation, right? I just add 24.0 grams plus 8.08. Did I get those right? 24 and 8.08. Okay. And I get 32.1 grams. So this is... about 32.1. All right, so if I'm trying to figure out how much carbon and how much hydrogen I need to get this amount, I have to do what I just did, right? I have to find what factor I need to multiply my formula by. And if you remember what I did, I, I set up the problem but basically I end up taking 128, that's what I want, and I divide it by what I started with, my formula, and I get a factor of four, okay? That's my factor. So in order to know how much I have to take my formula and multiply them by four. So I'm gonna take this number, multiply it by four. Take this number, multiply it by four. I hope this is making sense to you guys. So when I take 24.0, I keep saying 0, .0 but it's really 0, 0.0. Sorry about that. I get 96.0 grams of carbon. And here I get 32.3 grams of hydrogen. Okay, and those will allow. Now you're probably saying, wait, wait, wait. When I add 96, and 32.3. Oh, what am I doing? I really did not add that right. <laughs> this is what happened, you guys. Okay, I get 128.3, right? Um, sorry about that. This is actually 128.3. Did everybody see that? Grams, that would be a natural gas. So this is off. This answer and the sensor are off by 0.1. That's okay. Sometimes um, the reason why that happens is because it's due to rounding, okay? When you're rounding with significant figures, every now and then you're gonna be off by a slight amount. In this case, it's okay. There might be times where it's not. This one's fine. If you have questions about it, talk to me. But this is definitely within reason. But the whole point of doing this problem is I wanna make sure that you guys understand the law of definite proportions, okay? Hopefully you do. And we're moving on. All right, so that brings us to Dalton's atomic theory. Basically, both the law of definite proportions and the law of mass conservation led Dalton to his theory, which included four vital assumptions, okay? You guys will need to know these. Um, the first assumption was that all elements are composed of small indivisible particles called atoms. The second assumption was that all atoms of the same element have exactly the same properties. The third assumption, which is basically the reverse of the second one, is that atoms of different elements would therefore have different properties. And his last and fourth assumption was that compounds are formed when atoms are joined together. Since atoms are indivisible, they can join together only in simple whole number ratios. Okay, so that's those are the assumptions that Dalton came up with. Now over time, scientists have found that a few of Dalton's assumptions aren't completely right. The first one, for example, has a small mistake. 
because under the right circumstances, atoms can be split apart. So they aren't truly indivisible. But in, our, in this course in chemistry, we aren't gonna be splitting atoms. So for our purposes, we are going to assume that Dalton was right on this assumption, okay? The second one is also not quite right. Certain atoms within an element can actually be heavier than other atoms in the same element. We'll get to this a little bit later. I wanna say maybe module three um, should be coming up shortly, but these are actually called isotopes. So I just want you to be aware of that. This is the end of the reading that you guys had for this week. So this ends this lecture, and then I want you to finish out the chapter. Um, I'm also gonna show you all of the things that you should be working on this week. Okay guys, so I said I was going to show you what you should be working on this week. I'm just basically going to tell you. You should be finishing your reading, which are pages 61 through 77, which should be the end of module two. So after this week, you'll have read all of module two. That includes doing the on your own problems within the chapter. That's a minimum. Um, you guys definitely need to be doing the on your own problems. There are also other problems you could be working on. I highly suggest that. It might just depend on how much time you have each week. I also need you guys to finish your lab report. So you should be working on your lab report for 2.1. Make sure to look over the handouts I gave you in class that show you exactly what I'm looking for with the example. And you also, in your lab notebooks that you received, after you do your reading, you will have read through experiments 2.2 and 2.3. I need you before class to go ahead and go into your notebooks and write down your hypothesis. If you are unsure of what a hypothesis is, it's basically a educated guess. What do you think is going to happen in the experiment? Okay. And if you remember, I told you it, you don't have to be right. Um, it's just what you think is going to happen. So I need you to go ahead and do that in your lab notebooks before class so that you don't forget to do it before we do the experiments. Also, I wanted you guys to know um, that I went through and uploaded most of your quizzes, most of your test grades. Um, some of your grades changed a little bit. I think I'm gonna end up grading everybody's tests and quizzes. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. We can talk about that. And I also put a few resources up on the page as well. I have the periodic table of elements if you wanna have one printed that's easy reference for you. I also have a short video linking um, to a fun video on YouTube about the first 30 elements that you need to know. And so I thought it was a fun way. So make sure you're checking the page. I will put some resources and information up there for you every now and then. I'll try and remind you. As always, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me, contact me, text me, all of those work. Okay, hope you guys have a great week.